Hey there, John. I think we're underway. This is Glenn Lowry. This is The Glenn Show, sponsored by the Manhattan Institute. I'm at Brown University. I'm with my regular conversation partner every other week here at The Glenn Show, The Black Guys. He's John McWhorter. He teaches at Columbia University. He writes twice weekly a newsletter column for The New York Times. Hey, John. How you doing, man? I'm good, Glenn. How are you? Uh, today is my birthday, John. Oh, I didn't know. Wow. You should feel honored, uh, and the audience as well, that I'm taking time out of my precious birthday, my 74th anniversary of my birth. That is a noble age to be. Wow. Are you going to eat good food? Okay, so here's the menu. Uh, I had a breakfast sandwich this morning. My lovely wife, Lawan, who you know, uh, is taking care of me today. It's my special day. And we have friends coming over. It's going to be a dinner party of eight, early evening. Mm. And uh, she is grilling a rack of lamb. Oh, I want that. Which oh. has been marinating in mint and uh, garlic. For a long and time? Yeah, mm. man. Mm. Yeah. Huh. We're going to have her patented, everybody get ready, collard greens. Okay. She got some, oh. some bacon fat. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> she got her coconut milk. She uses coconut milk in this amazing concoction that ends up coming, and the greens practically melt in your mouth. Mm. Uh, black eyed peas. We are going southern. Fuck. Yeah, she's soaked up a big bowl of black eyed peas. They start out all dry and scrunched up, and you put them in the yeah. water. You leave them overnight, and they absorb and they expand, and they're going to be cooked with onion and you know uh, whatever. Mm. And uh, a peach. Cobbler. Of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to feast. That. that sounds <laughs> fantastic. Wow. Mm. Everybody says I don't look like I'm a day over 60 or whatever. I'll take it knocking on wood over here. Uh, health is holding up, although I had a bursitis attack uh, that uh, has uh, it drove me to the uh, orthopedic guy because I thought something was wrong with my hip. But it turned out that it was inflammation of the tissue that has since subsided. I'm, I'm so you can I'm just okay. use some some cord of some some steroids. He injected a cortisone injection to the site, and yeah. um, I and I just uh, was hobbled a little bit, but I'm I'm back to full capacity now. So fantastic! So I'm I'm feeling pretty wow. good on my 74th birthday. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations! Appreciate wow. it. I'm still thinking about that food. Oh. <laughs> I hey. wish that I wish that you could join us, uh, you and your lovely partner. I wish that you guys could join us. And you're going to have red wine with it, right? Uh, yeah, and I'm going to have to confess, there is a good bottle of single malt that is going to accompany, you know, as an aperitif uh, and also as a nightcap. As, as an aperitif, <laughs> right. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've, I've got to change my life. That sounds fantastic. Well, no, what I think you should do, John, I think everybody would like this, including our audience, is get on the train. It's only a couple of hours up here to Providence. Uh, we can do an in-person session in uh, my office slash studio of our conversation. And then we can party hardy into the wee hours of the morning. That would be swell. You and yeah. uh, <laughs> Oksana, that's her name, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. We should, that should be like an autumn thing. Yeah. 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 We should Late actually fall. do it. We should definitely do it. Definitely. Wow. Okay. We're the Glenn Show. We're the Black Guys. We're back. And uh, John, <laughs> we've already, no, no. In the comments, people have already been commenting. Like we didn't broadcast last week because we had a snafu. And so we're one week off schedule. We're just going to continue every other week from here. And we'll be doing the Q&A soon within a week or so for the, uh, for the month of uh, August slash September. But uh, people are already commenting. I'm glad they say that you guys missed the week because now you have the chance to discuss John's encounter on Twitter mm -hmm. <laughs> with Ibram X. Kendi. You want to tell us about that? <laughs> and, and by the way, we should put up a link in the uh, description of this post to the Twitter exchange between our own John McWhorter and uh, the guy with three names, Ibram X. You know, I just, um, I wrote a piece. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> I wrote a piece where I was just saying that there's this movement afoot among certain social workers to um, get rid of the standardized tests that they use for licensure for being a social worker because black and Latino people proportionally tend not to do as well on it. So there was the idea that because black and Latino people don't do as well on it, the test is racist. And I just said that, no, unless you can look at the test and say, this question is biased against certain kinds of brown people. And nobody does that, at least not anymore, because you can't find any questions like that. You can't say that, then we have to get beyond this idea that it's just somehow immoral or uncivil to subject brown skin people to tests. It's just, it's not sophisticated. And what I was trying to do was not, you know, like what I just said is like some editorial that would run in, I'm going to insult somebody, whoever I, it's something that would run in the New York Post, where you just say, you know, they're not biased. But then I said, so nevertheless, black and Latino people do tend not to do as well on the test. Why is that? And I was making the simple point that it's not a choice between thinking that there's something wrong with the test and thinking that black people are dumb. I said, it's neither of those things. What is it? And I talked about aspects of how language is used among people of different social classes and how how language is used can be very rich in working class culture, but it doesn't prepare you as well for the abstraction of tests as the way language is used among middle class people. I used a classic study from the 1980s a woman, an anthropologist who studied a white middle class culture, a black working class culture, and a white working class culture, and came to similar conclusions about the two working class cultures. And so I was just saying that the problem that we have is that that kind of working class linguistic culture is wonderful in many ways, but it doesn't prepare you well for the abstraction of these tests. And so I stressed, and I'm almost done, I stressed there is not anything wrong with anybody. I said, I am not calling out black culture. I said it twice in the piece. And then I also said in the piece, this is also true of white working class people. So then here comes Henry Rogers. I mean, Ibram X. Kendi. And, <laughs> and Henry Rogers basically writes this long thread because, you know, the Atlantic, I'm sure, won't let him, you know, write the article he probably wants to write about me in the Atlantic. I'm sure they won't let him. So whenever he gets mad at me, he does some long Twitter thread. And he writes that <laughs> I say that I'm not criticizing black culture, but then I go ahead and do it because I said, you know, disproportionately in even some black middle class culture because of cultural lag, which is universal. There is that old school way of using language and that that lag is something understandable in any culture. And I am not saying it's a flaw, but the question is how you usher a culture into the new ways. Kendi doesn't get that. Yeah, uh, on my reading of his uh, reaction, it is, if it's a uh, detriment to the performance, it is a flaw with the culture. You're trying to have it both ways. You're trying to say the culture doesn't prepare people to do well on this particular kind of test. Then you're trying to say there's nothing wrong with the culture. Well, mm -hmm. he thinks that's just a contradiction. Right. And that doesn't make him insane, but it does, frankly, make him a poor reader. I'm sorry. Because I anticipated people thinking that way because it's a fair thing to think at first. And if you yeah. read the piece, I make it very clear that I am not finding fault. And if he thinks that my saying there's an aspect of the culture established in the past that is disconsonant with the requirements of modernity right now, if what he hears in that is me dissing black people, what that is is crude. It means that he doesn't understand sequential reasoning. And I'm sorry to say that about him, but that thread was almost willfully uncomprehending. And the sad thing is I know it's the best he can do. So that's what it was. Somebody commented on his SAT score in the comments and responded. Did you see that? I did not. Apparently there's, I mean, you can search for it and you can find it. Uh, and I, I, I am not giving this of my own account. I am only repeating what someone said in the comment that there's evidence that his SAT, combined SAT score was about 1,000. That's about 500 on the verbal and on the math. That's near the median. It might even be below the median of the distribution of performance. It's definitely not, not particularly high. I think he says that about himself somewhere, actually. Okay. He gives him so credit. Yeah, he doesn't like tests. Comports, with he, his, yeah. comports with his position. 
that the tests are not measuring very well the abilities of people and that there's something wrong with the test, which is exactly what you're contradicting in your argument. He's well, saying, look, I'm smart. I have succeeded. I've written books, um, including books that have won prizes. I've gotten big grants. I'm a professor at the university. I have a following. I have an influence on the culture. You're telling me I'm not smart. I'm smart. Uh, and he's not saying this on my account. I'm just telling you what someone said about him. Maybe he said it himself. I don't know. He had a relatively unimpressive performance on the standardized test himself. Not everybody tests well. The tests don't measure our true ability. His default position is if you've got a big racial difference in the people who are proportion of people who are passing, given that we know that blacks are just as capable as any other group, your default position should be to question the instrument because the instrument is is reporting back to us uh, information that we know is not true based on our lived experience. And this is the problem. That was a brilliant summary of his his impression, including making him sound like the sane person that he is. But the problem is this. Someone like him stops at the test is racist and just stops there. It's like throwing down a gauntlet. He doesn't seem to feel any need to specify how is it racist. And that is frankly evidence of a certain kind of incuriosity because frankly, anybody watching the discussion wants to know what Okay, how is it racist? To not explain how the questions are racist today. And let's face it, nobody on those tests is asking what wine goes with chicken these days. It's nothing like that. So what what is it? It's like if you you read some story about you're at a zoo and you read that I walked by the walrus cage and I heard the walrus talk. So then I went and I told the zookeeper that the walrus was talking. The zookeeper tripped over his shoelaces and had to go to the emergency room. And then I remember that I needed to go to the, and you're thinking, but wait, wait, what did the walrus say? Why would you write that story about the walrus talking and not say what the walrus said? In the same way, well, the test is racist. How? And somebody like him never says That is an incomplete style of reasoning, and frankly, you wonder whether he could specify how. And then you have simple questions. Did I read the comments this time? I must admit that I did look at a fair amount of the comments, because what's interesting about this on Twitter, and I try not to do too much Twitter these days, I got more love on Twitter than him, and I did not get my love only from people who read the National Review. He got a trickle. I kind of won that one. And I found it interesting. One person was saying, so, okay, are spelling bees biased against non-South Asian people because of who wins them these days? And then the old question, is basketball biased against sure. white people because black people are better at it? And the thing is, this is it's this incompleteness. People like Kendi never have an answer to that question. Maybe there's an answer. You could probably get into their head and come up with what their answer might be. Why is it different with tests? But they never even answer. And then they claim that it's racist to contradict them or to not think of them as great thinkers. It won't do. Okay, I I think a couple of things. I mean, I'm an economist. We have a PhD program. We teach uh, students. Um, We have a choice about how much technical emphasis to put in our curriculum, how much math, how much statistics, you know, how much abstraction versus how much more sociological and historical information to put in our curriculum. You know, uh, how does the society work, the economy fit within it? Uh, there are subfields in economics which are more or less demanding of technical specialization. Mm. So the people who want to do statistics as their main thing could specialize in mathematical statistics. The people who want to do a more, you know, historically descriptive and uh, rich kind of uh, detailed account about the history of this industry or whatever, the emergence of that, they could do a less technical program. It turns out that if I were just looking at headcounts uh, on the uh, graduate record exams, mathematics part, there are not so many Blacks who do extremely well. Uh, men are overrepresented relative to women amongst those who do extremely well on the quantitative. Um, I could design my curriculum and my instruments of selecting graduate students to put less emphasis on the quantitative, it would change the field. It would, it, would, it would make it a different experience. It would make for different kinds of dissertations, different kinds of research questions. De-emphasizing the mathematics 
and emphasizing the uh, historical, social, theoretic, uh, philosophic, uh, sociological dimensions of economic study. And if I did so, the scores, quote unquote, the relevant scores on the relevant tests of applicants would show more blacks in the right tail. And I'd end up with more black economists, more black, more female economists, et cetera. So if a member of that group comes along and says, we're looking at the test that you use, we're looking at the outcome, and we are underrepresented amongst those whom you're selecting, uh, we think that's unfair. We think it locks in historical privilege. We think it is a reflection of a particular, narrow, and arbitrary view about things. Here is another way of doing social work. Here's another way of doing economics. Here's another way of teaching people about society that if you used those instruments would be more favorable in the selection process to our group, and we think that's justice. I think that that's kind of what's being said here, uh, although I don't think quite as clearly articulated. <laughs> but, 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 you know, the test is bad by virtue of the fact that it generates disparate results. It's just a way of saying the thing that the test is measuring should not be getting so much emphasis because when you put the emphasis on that thing, you exclude our people. And, I, and if, if he or she, whoever is making this argument, were to put it that way, then we would get down to talking about, in my case, in the case of my example, exactly what is economics. Can we really discover the root causes of inflation by avoiding the immersion in time series econometrics where you have to take masses of data and tease out causal relationships? Can, can we really solve the problem of how to regulate Silicon Valley or uh, uh, tech monopolies if we don't have complex intricate game theoretic representations of the imperfect competition that goes on amongst those and, and that that kind of that kind of thing. Uh, and I think actually I can defend the contemporary practice of economics on those grounds, but that's where we would have to fight. And the problem is that the people who make the kind of claims that you're making, and I think you are explaining exactly what's going on in their heads, exactly what they mean, they never even broach this next part. You know, the issue is, okay, if we didn't do it the old-fashioned way, would we lose anything? And I, I honestly think that what a lot of people are those thinking, what, what, what a lot of those people are thinking is, well, we don't like numbers. We find all of that dry. It would be putting an awful lot of effort into something that we, we don't cotton to as much as we cotton to studying a history, rooting out injustice, writing about our feelings, writing about other people's feelings. And I'm sorry, but that's just not fucking good enough. And I think they expect us to intuit that and kind of all do high fives. No, that is a rejection of the enlightenment and modernity and complexity. And you have to at least have the conversation. And frankly, I think they'd lose it. But even if they wouldn't, the idea that we're not supposed to talk about what the field would lose if you did it in a different way yeah. suggests that they're going more on the gut. And I don't think, and I'm anticipating you, I don't think they're standing there with guns in their holster daring anybody to say anything else. I think that they genuinely think, and this is the, the, mo the most recent piece that I wrote, they genuinely think that decrying the racism is as valid and important an action as proving what you can do despite the racism. And they figure they've done their job and they don't like numbers. And so they don't really feel like grappling with the other thing. And they figure that's the answer because among them, none of them have any problem with that. But they're not thinking about the larger picture or if they do, they're trained to think that anybody who has anything to say but amen, who is not one of them, is biased against them or somehow just is trying not to understand. And that's a paranoid view of other people, that's exactly how not to have constructive engagement or argumentation. So with social work, my very simple question is, if you can't ask test questions, what's the other way? And is it true that you would really get the same result in terms of quality of care of vulnerable people? Would you get the same result by just clocking how many hours somebody did and supervising them? Is it really true that being able to pass a test doesn't matter? And who said? And what's, what's the argument? I cannot stand people who don't make the argument and just toss around the word racism and figure that they have done their job and are looked at by outside observers who pretend that that makes sense because it's okay when somebody has dreadlocks. That's not the way things should go. You know, you're talking about social work education and I'm, tr I'm thinking about medical education uh, as another mm. arena in which these kind of questions might rise, the MCAT 
medical college aptitude test as a screen for getting into a uh, medical school. And the various specializations, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. where there'll, there'll be examinations for you to get certified as an anesthesiologist or, you know, an orthopedic surgeon or whatever it might be. Uh, you've got disparity uh, of representation by race in those fields, and you've got questions about whether the instruments of selection are intrinsically biased. I actually don't know enough about medical education to have an opinion about what they're doing, but it's an area, another area where I would imagine these kind of questions um, arise. So your, your account for the differences in the case at hand, social work certification examinations, but more broadly, is uh, cultural and having to do with ling- linguistic uh, acquisition of language early in life and patterns that differ by race and by class. Definitely. And not culture. I guess that word is now so loaded. Most people now hear the word culture and they think bad thing about the culture. But yeah, it's about how you use language and the fact that the disembodied abstract question is not natural to ordinary human interaction. Quick Quick anecdote. I haven't thought about this in years in relation. But, but is, excuse me, but is common amongst middle, upper middle class whites in America. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where the source of their middle advantage. class black people. But working class culture, for all of the wonderful things about it, is not one that usually prepares you for, you know, answering what's the capital of Minnesota for no particular reason. That's a, that's a weird thing. I went to a Montessori school um, back in the, in the early and mid 70s. Where when I look back, it's clear that the white kids, the Jewish kids were paying full freight, but there was clearly some sort of scholarship program to bring in working class black kids into the school. Because I doubt most of their parents could afford the tuition. They were coming from the different side of the city. There was something going on, which is a wonderful thing. But And of course, I didn't think of it that way at the time. But when I look back... Those kids had a harder time at Montessori school. And I think in school, it's not because they were troubled. You know, we're talking about kids who are eight and nine at this point. It's not that they, none of these kids, unless I'm missing something, had violent home lives. It wasn't that. They weren't from the inner city. They were just, you know, working class and lower middle class kids. Just the question, the the straight question would throw those kids. And so an outside tester would come in, like basically beginning to train us to take standardized tests. I remember this one woman, you know, she had no idea what the differences between people were, how to make people comfortable. And she had this high nasal voice. And I happened to be sitting there with another black kid, except we were from completely different worlds. He was a working class black Philadelphia kid, 1974. And the woman asked me, you know, so John, what is five plus five? I said, 10. Because I was used to being asked that. I don't like math, but I knew, you know, five, it's 10. And who cares? But I'm answering a question. Then she asked, what is two plus two? And he, he looked and he's like a deer caught in the headlights. And he said, huh? Now, he understood what she said. And I don't think it was beyond him what happens when you add two and two. But this woman just asked the question, what is it? And she asked him again, what is two plus two? And again, he said, huh? And I kind of nudged him. That's how he said it. He was so scared. And so I kind of nudged him. And I said, remember with the beads, like the way that you learn math in Montessori, think about two things and then another two things. What would it be together? And he said, like four? And I said, you just, <laughs> just say four. So he said four. But that woman asking him like that, he didn't get it. And she wasn't scary. But the idea that you're going to just answer this meaningless question for no reason, that didn't happen in that household. I knew his sister, too. That's it. He, I'm sure, grew up and had trouble on standardized tests. It's not because he's dumb. It's that I came from a very artificial environment. That's called the book-lined middle-class home. That's all it is. And that's not a fault. I think you can all see that I don't think that that guy was faulty. I liked him. But we came from different environments where his prepared him less well than mine did for the artificiality of being asked some damn question. That's all it is. I'm not putting anybody down. And I think that that's been explained by various studies about how language is used. Um, language, what is it? Um, la- orality and Literacy by Walter Ong is one of my favorite books that discusses this in a way that's much more entertaining than that title sounds like. Anytime you read language and li- uh, or- la- orality and literacy, you know instantly why people from some worlds are better at standardized tests than others, and you don't find anybody faulty in it. But if you can't say that sort of thing in public without being called a reverse racist. Something is wrong. And luckily, I think most people understood what I was trying to say. 
but Henry Rogers felt differently. And it was an interesting occasion because I think it outed him somewhat. I think it needed to be seen how uncomprehending that kind of thinking is. The culture third rail of uh, social inequality discussion. You can't make cultural arguments. Uh, things have to be structural or it's a no-go. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a little befuddled by that position, rejecting, uh, uh, among identitarians, amongst people who are very self-consciously Black or very self-consciously Jewish. Um, if I think that groups are different from one another in ways that I can distinguish, I mean, there is blackness. If blackness has some meaning to it, surely it is reflected, at least in part, in culture. We were talking about food at the start of this conversation and, you know, the influence of the Southern African-American uh, social origins is reflected in the menu that I'm going to be enjoying. Oh, this, this is important. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. this evening. But music, music. Uh, but style, I mean, part of the pride that a lot of black people take in blackness is hipness, is coolness. It's, it's, it's dance. It's, it's a spontaneous vitality of expression. It's, uh, you know, how you move your body, how you, how you make love. And anybody who says <laughs> that's racist is faking, just in, in interjecting that. It, it's part of the content of what we're talking about when we talk about different groups. Groups are different in part precisely because of cultural expression that has varied across different subsets of the human population. The identity that I identify with has content. What, what does it mean to be black? And then I have a list. And if I take a piece of paper and write down what it means to be black, I'm going to be talking about culture. So how can I at one in the, at the same time uh, call myself instead of Mr. Rogers? And, and I don't know if it's a uh, uh, ethical sin to refuse to use somebody's chosen told, name. It's, it's really tacky to. You to can't do use that for a trans person. person. If you do that for a trans person, you're done. Okay, so don't. There's a, her you there's know. a heuristic usefulness in using his original name because I think his name makes people see him as having a certain mystique that they would not otherwise. But still, yeah, we're probably being. Well, but he, but he elected a different name. And where did he get that name from? And what was he trying to say with it? Ibram. You know, what, what, what's Kindy? What, what, what's the point? I mean, the point is a cultural reference, isn't it? It's an identification with a particular way of being in the world. So on the one hand, we have groups who are di differentiated by these cultural frames, which are obviously consequential. I mean, I don't explain the overrepresentation of blacks in the NBA or the overrepresentation of Jews on Wall Street by their genes. I, I don't think it's their genes. <laughs> Neither do I think it's, strictly speaking, discrimination, where in the NBA and the professional, uh, I should say, amateur basketball world that leads up to it, they discriminate in favor of blacks, and that's why blacks are overrepresented. Or on Wall Street, they're not interested in making money. They're just interested in hiring more Jews. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think the groups differ in their cultures that orients their people towards spending their limited time developing different aspects of their human potential, which is then reflected in their performance in these different venues. How can I have groups as between which equity is supposed to be fashioned and at the same time expect that in every arena of human endeavor, these groups are going to perform in exactly the same way? That it's, it's just a contradiction in terms. So I, I think they're... Uh, rejection of the cultural argument while holding on to the identitarian claim, which is what Ibram X. Kendi is doing. He's black and he's for black people. And he's fighting for black people. So black people are a thing that exists in the world. And yet he refuses to allow me to say anything about what the specific content of that blackness is that bears on any social outcome. I just think that's incoherent. It is incoherent, as is another foundation of this kind of position, which is Anybody can see that part of the reason for that overrepresentation of black people in, say, basketball is, is the culture. It, it's valued. You are, you are doing it from a very early age. You're encouraged to do it. And many people would consider that a good thing. Ooh, specific, real specific. 
took my um took my girls to McDonald's just this morning. You might even call that a little cultural compared with most of the people I'm around. Yeah. And there was a black dad and a little black girl. The black girl, I'm going to put her at two, two. She's dancing across the floor over to the over to the place where you order. It's, this was like an hour ago. And I just noticed she's already got it. She's already got a, a, a sense of rhythm and movement that, you know, my girls will probably never have. And I thought, look at how a human being drinks in what she sees people around her doing. I've seen that all my life, little, especially little black girls who already can bust a move. And that's culture. And I think many people say that that's fine. But the idea seems to be that there's no such thing as a negative or even a, a now disadvantageous cultural trait unless it's white people. So white people apparently have all these terrible things about them. But if you're not white, then all of your cultural traits have to be good things. None of them can be things that somebody might sit down and think about as no longer consonant with the way times have changed. That is shit anthropology. That is not a sophisticated way of looking at what humanity is. But that's the underlying position. All cultural traits are good unless you're white. No, no. Prove it, as far as I'm concerned. Well, let's talk about uh, that other uh, piece of yours, which um, our friend Ibram X. Kendi has not yet had the opportunity to react to. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, everybody, John is putting out two columns a week. I don't know how anybody does that while he holds down another job at the you same time. You know, Glenn, time. actually, I, I reduced it to one. And then every two months, I'm going to do a longer piece because I can't do that. For another oh, year. okay. Well, too much. you're I human. Was... I never knew how you were doing it. I, I couldn't understand it. I didn't moment. either. But <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> but uh, he's he's putting them out at the New York Times. And this most recent one, uh, how do you call it? Proving racists wrong. Uh, I see no black pride in finding that calling out prejudice is more interesting than countering it with achievement, mm -hmm. which really fascinated me. Um, when read, because to be honest, I, I forget them after I write them, read like that final part where I quote Shelby Steele, because I think people should hear this. Okay. If you have it in front of you. I do have it in front of me. Uh, Shelby Steele, whose classic, The Content of Our Character, A New Vision of Race in America, won a 1990 National Book Critics Circle Award captured the essence of the matter in a 1989 essay to which you link here. The increased opportunity of the post-civil rights era presented, quote, a brutal proposition to black America. Quote, if you're not inferior, prove it. And you conclude black pride means at the end of the day, proving it. It's important. And a lot of people would tell us we shouldn't have to prove it. No, I, I can't have that. That, that's a bad fashion. You do have to prove it, even if the past and even the present are imperfect. You have to prove it or you haven't made a case. Hey, here, I think, is the key uh, sentence in your piece. Underestimation must be countered with demonstration, not indignation. <laughs> I must admit I like that one. Yeah, that's true. It's true. I mean, you start with the anecdote of talking about how when you were at Stanford, was it? And uh, they were putting together a kind of Jeopardy-like, uh, you know, college competition mm -hmm. uh, for answering trivia questions. And the, the white guys kind of left you out off the team. They didn't pick you because they assumed, but you being black, you didn't know it. And you were confronted with oh, a indeed. dilemma, either to be pissed off and tuck your tail between your legs and go to the corner, injured by the fact that they overlooked you because they had the presupposition that a black guy wasn't a nerd. Mm -hmm. or to show them just how insufferably nerdy you actually are. <laughs> I chose the second one. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that was, and, you know, they all literally huddled over on the other side of the room, left me out. It felt like being left out when they are picking people for sports, which I had, of course, endured as well. Here I am in this nerdy setting, and I'm being treated the same way, and I thought, it's because I'm black. All right, it couldn't be anything else. And I thought, I'll show them, because I know some some stupid stuff. And I showed that. <laughs> and I don't think it changed the world, but that was my response. For me to run away saying I feel unwelcome, that would have been the lowliest form. And I thought, you know, that somebody needs to show them that black people can know stupid little things. And I'm one of the black people who can. And, you know, it's not that I turned them upside down, but I thought I was making a little contribution. And this is another a quick codicil about that. 
One of the guys who ran to the other side of the room just by chance at the end of that school year, I met him. I had occasion to know him in a certain setting fairly well. He wasn't the devil. You know, he was actually very open minded. He was, frankly, a Democrat. He was a you know good white person. Nevertheless, that bias clearly affected him that morning when they were very quickly trying to form teens, which shows that human beings are complicated. And it wasn't that he was thinking, oh, there's that N-word over on the other side of the room. He wasn't that tight. But certainly, he did fall under the influence of a certain kind of bias to show that I understand that in that particular situation. He was a late 20th century enlightened white person who still wasn't anything like all the way there. But he wasn't a monster. Those guys weren't monsters. But they did read me wrong. And I decided I'm damn well going to show them. And I did. I wish all of us had that orientation. I feel unwelcome. Well, why don't you show them that they should have welcomed you more? And a per- kind of person says, well, I shouldn't have to. And yes, yeah. that's true. But you have to anyway, because there's no other way for them to know. You have to anyway. That's the thing. That's a heavy, that's a heavy thing to, to actually accept. I have something to prove. They doubt my competency. And the burden is on me. I mean, it is so seductively inviting to see it as a microaggression. They doubt my competency here yet again to feel oneself burdened. Now I have to prove to these motherfuckers that I can actually, yeah. you know, um, and uh, to, uh, I don't know, uh, ball up into a, you know, defensive crouch or storm off, you know, angrily or reject or to, to take oneself out of the mix. It's them and me, it's them and me. Instead of, instead of saying, okay, however reasonable or unreasonable their doubts might be, I'm confident about my own capacities. And that's an important provision. Are you? Do you have something to prove to yourself? It's the that's proving the not just to them, but also to me. When I say I don't have to prove it to them, am I taking the weight off of myself because I'm now rejecting the entire enterprise and I never have to face up to my own doubts about my own, you know, that, that kind of thing. That's the other thing. Yeah. It was interesting that morning, though, I'm looking back, reconstructing my feelings. I thought that wasn't nice. But I thought, I want to do the college bowl. I'd always wanted to try something like that. And I thought the only way I'm going to try it is if I just deal with this. And I thought, well, you know what? In a way, there's a novelty for me. Because when I participate, when I answer a question correctly, everybody's going to be kind of surprised. I'm going to feel a little bit special. And that's exactly what happened. I just thought to myself, I want to do it. This world is imperfect. There wasn't going to be a warm, friendly, all-black college bowl. This was my one chance, and you can get hit by a bus the next day. I thought, if I'm going to do college bowl, they're going to ask me these stupid questions. It's going to be like on Jeopardy. I wish to do this. Okay, something imperfect happened. I don't. I, I can't fix it, but I'm going to go do my thing. Uh, deal me in is how I felt. And I think that should be a norm. Some people are going to listen to this and think I'm saying, why can't you be like me? But no, I didn't feel like this. I felt like this. I felt normal. I think that other black people are taught to be abnormal and thinking it's more important to decry the racism and run away crying than to just pitch in and show that you can do what they don't think you can. I had a friend when I was growing up. I've written about my friendship with Woody uh, in uh, essay, uh, long published in commentary. 25 years ago, I'm reprising it a little bit, this uh, relationship I had with Woody. You're always talking about your personal anecdotes. Let me tell you one. So Woody, <laughs> Woody was a black guy in the sense that both his mother and his father were Negroes in the 1950s and 60s when we were growing up in Chicago. He lived right across the alley from me, a stone's throw in a neighborhood that had been all white and his family had been living in it. And then the neighborhood became almost all black, except for a few white people scattered here and there, of which I thought his family was one until I found out, Mm. in fact, his family had been passing for white. Really? Because both his mother and father had Negro (laughs) ancestors, but they were both fair. They were both light skinned. Fair enough. Fair enough that they could be assumed to be white people. And they had, you know, they had passed for white. And then the neighborhood flipped and Woody got kind of caught in a vice because he looked like a white kid. If you looked at him just casually, you'd say, but if you look more closely, you could see maybe there was a little bit of, you know, maybe. The you way know. we can see our own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So here, I'm telling you all this to tell you this. Woody was my best friend coming up, you know, 12 years old, 14 years old, 16 years old. 
And we like to play a game, you know, pick up basketball games, you know, touch football. Uh, you know, we were in the Little League together, strike out the, you know, the stickball thing that you play against the brick wall where you draw the square and you throw the rubber ball and <laughs> whatnot. Um, and uh, people just always assumed that Woody wasn't as athletic as everybody else. And in fact, he was. He was a slight built, short stature, but sinewy and tough as nails. OK, and. He spent practically his entire adolescence proving to people that he wasn't a punk, that he wasn't a chump, that he wasn't, you know, soft, which they assumed because in that part of the black working class world that I lived in, a white kid was thought, you know, I mean, he can't run, he can't jump, he, he, you know, he's not going to be able to do the behind the back pass, he can't dribble, and he can't take a hit on the football field, he can't take a hit. Woody went out for the wrestling team at his high school at 130 pounds. <laughs> he played catcher on the Little League team where you have to take the hit when the guy's coming down the third baseline and you got the ball on the throw from the plate and you got to make the tag and he's going to ball, uh, you know, roll over you and you got to hold on to the, you know, you got to take the... He did everything he could to demonstrate. I know you think I'm a white guy. I know you think I can't dance and I can't jump and I can't play. Well... And when it came time for dating, mm. he found Elvie. Mm. Elvie was a very dark-skinned girl. And when you saw him and Woody, her and Woody together, it was like salt and pepper. And uh, he would stride into the room with her on her arm by way of saying, if you don't recognize that I'm a brother by now, you know, mm. take a look over here. <laughs> you know. <laughs> He 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 uh, he uh, confronted the challenge, then he faced up to it. And I guess I'm telling the story to say I wonder if everybody is made for that kind of mm. struggle. Mm. Aren't there people? I mean, he was a tough kid, and and he faced up to it. He he could easily have retreated into some kind of self pity, and withdrawn and passed for white. He could you know he could say to hell with you guys, but he he stuck it out and and he saw it through. And maybe that's a lot to ask of the, you know, ordinary Joe or Jane. Maybe, maybe we're asking too much if we ask people to be heroic. Do I have to be a hero in order just to live decently? Doesn't the system owe me something? This is, I'm imagining what the other side of this argument might look like. And the answer to that, very reasonable. That's a, an important, it's a very modern question. The question has to be asked, but then there's an answer, and it's not the one that I think a lot of people want to hear. If it's so unreasonable to expect us to just get in and do the work now, why do we not think that was true in 1950? So go back to 1950. Nobody in power was interested in hearing these arguments that the rules should be changed for us. And so if you were a black achiever, you went in and you did your job and those people are now on websites and flashcards, and we talk about what heroes they were. Are we supposed to think that today we're ahead of that world? Because that kind of black person doesn't have to try as hard. What we do now is we say we're going to change the game. So maybe the answer to that is, well, those people had no choice, and we celebrate what they pulled off. But today, we're going to do something different. Our victory is going to be in changing the system. And the answer to that is when you change the system today, are you also not making it easier? Are you going to change it in a way which is also, frankly, dumbing it down? Change it in a way that's qualitatively the same as the way it is now. Okay, show what an unbiased standardized test question is and then write one and apply it. But is what you're doing really making it simpler, making it more intuitive? Because if so, why is that always what we do? Why is that always the answer? And frankly, it always is. That's the problem. Okay. What happened to Woody? Do you know? Uh, he's passed away um, a few years ago. Woody um, graduated from Illinois Institute of Technology and uh, went to law school at Loyola Law School in Chicago and got his law degree. Um, he was a, a public defender trying, uh, defending capital cases of people who were accused of murder and whatnot. He was a civil rights lawyer and a pro-defendant, uh, you know, soldier in the justice, uh, you know, mass incarceration struggles in Chicago. 
Um, he and LV had two kids together. They broke up. Uh, he remarried. Um, and uh, it's a it's a yeah, it's story. a complicated story. It's a it's a complicated mm-hmm. story. I'm, I'm leaving out some of the details because we don't have forever here. Uh, but uh, Ira Glass, the uh, public uh, radio uh, personality who puts uh, this, American this American Life, life. out of WBEZ in Chicago, about 20 years ago, did a feature on me and Woody. Really? Huh. He interviewed me. He interviewed Woody because this essay that I wrote described a particular event. The event was Fred Hampton had been murdered by police authorities in Chicago. The Black Panther Party, which was strong on the South Side where Woody and I lived, was holding rallies and meetings to confer with the community about how to respond to the murder of Fred Hampton. Woody and I were at one of those meetings. It was boisterous. He was the only white person in the room. Quote, unquote. quote He looked white. He's black, but he looks white. Mm-hmm. So he would have been assumed to be white. So these guys up in front of who are running the meeting, when Woody raises his hand and wants to say something, call him out and say, you, you know, what are you, white infiltrator in here in our meeting? Uh, and who can vouch for this white guy, they say. Okay, he and I had come to the meeting together. He's my best friend. Has been for 10 years. I don't vouch for him in that meeting. I, I stay silent. And he's asked to leave the meeting and he leaves. And I didn't vouch for him because I wanted to be accepted among the black radicals. And I thought if I, you know, who was that going to be vouching for me? I brought a white boy to the meeting. I, 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 I chickened out. I lost my nerve. I betrayed my friend in that moment of need on behalf of the idea of being accepted by strangers. I didn't really know those people in that room, but they were black and I wanted to be black. I want to be down with the brothers. I'm 20 years old. Give me a break, okay? I wanted to identify and be accepted by the brothers. I wanted to be a radical. I feared that if I tried to speak up for the white boy, I, I would be in bad order with the, with the black radicals in the room. So I, I, I betrayed my friend. And I wrote mm. an essay about this 20 years after the fact in which I berated myself, in, a, in effect, for um, making this phony thing about racial identity more important than the real thing which was the love that I had for this kid. I mean, we had come up together. We'd been through thick and thin together. That was my friend. I sacrificed the friendship for this abstract uh, uh, team joining uh, rah, rah, rah thing, which is thin. It's thin. It's not a thick connection to another person. It's uh, it's a it's a it's kind of phony. It, it, it won't last. It doesn't hold me up, it, you know, et cetera. This is what I'm trying to argue in the essay against racial identity as a totem, against it as a as a thing that you you are more than this. We're, we're, we're more than this. Woody and I were a lot more than the color of our skin. We had that together. I should have stood up for him. Anyway, he and I never spoke of this incident well, afterwards. Mm-hmm. It happened and I was ashamed and I didn't know what he felt. Maybe and he, he may be understood. Exactly. That's what mm-hmm. Ira discovered. Ira, when he interviewed him, <laughs> and by the way, his office in uh, some obscure building in downtown Chicago, uh, where he's the public defender, had one of these Huey Newton. You remember Huey Newton in the fan chair, the wicker Very chair well. with the big afro? Mm-hmm. That was a portrait that he had behind his desk. And the first thing that he says to Ira, it, it, this is, he's saying this in the year 1998, okay? <laughs> the first thing he, uh, Huey Newton in 1998, okay? And the first thing he says to Ira Glass is, I'm the whitest looking black man you're ever going to see. <laughs> so uh, when he lived and died, his, uh, his uh, uh, loyalty to his race. And when Ira asked him, uh, told him about the essay, which he hadn't seen of mine, and asked him how he felt about it, he said, Oh, I wish he had said something. I didn't know he anguished about it. Actually, I didn't think that much about it. He chose his people. He had to make a choice mm. between his friend and his people. He chose his people. I can understand that. Mm. That's pretty <laughs> big of him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's witty. 
You know, the two plus two guy, I'll say very briefly, call him Greg. He, um, I, I heard about him by the time I was in my 20s from somebody who was in a position to know. And it's interesting, culture, sometimes it does do things that you, that you wish it, it, it wouldn't. He um, had multiple you know, kids by multiple women by that age and had never gone to college. And yet yeah. many people would think that because he had been put in a Montessori school that it would shape him and put him in a different direction. And yeah, I get the feeling he was a very nice guy. But that happened because that's just what he knew. That's what was around him. And so the grand question is, you know, how do you handle that aspect of culture? By the time somebody is old enough to think outside of it, often their norm is what they knew. And so, yeah, it's just something I sometimes think about. He and I were sitting there at the same desks, using the same things with the same teachers for many years, and we've had completely different lives. And it's not because of some fault of his, but school can only do so much. It's also what you grow up in and how people are using language, what people consider important, what a norm is considered to be. We both were affected by, you know, the norms that we grew up among. Okay, we've got, I don't know, 10 minutes or so left here in the hour. Um, and we had uh, said we want to talk about Mitchell Jackson's oh, yeah. essay yeah. in Esquire on uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. Mitchell Jackson is an African-American writer. He's award-winning, I think, a Pulitzer Prize for magazine writing uh, on his uh, CV. And uh, talking of culture... He sets this piece in Pinpoint, Georgia, where Clarence Thomas was born and where he grew up in his early years before moving to Savannah and moving in with his grandfather, about which Thomas has written in his uh, memoir, My Grandfather's Son. Um, he starts, Jackson does in this essay, with the Gula Geechee uh, dialect of the people indigenous to Pinpoint, Georgia, which is where Thomas grew up and uh, develops uh, an argument uh, that is very disfavorable to Justice Thomas. And I, I, I want us to, to which when I shared this uh, with you and asked your thought, you said it was utterly nauseating, uh, the piece. And I was also very disturbed by the, by the piece, um, although intrigued by it in a way. I mean, he, he, he gets this long intro where uh, you're in Pinpoint, Georgia, and he's talking about the background that Clarence Thomas uh, lived in and came up in. And he gets every sentence gets translated into the dialect so that you're aware of how marginal, of, of, of how close to slavery, of how disadvantaged and impoverished and segregated and, uh, you know, et cetera, is this background. He, he encounters people and he, in effect, is saying to you, that could have been Clarence Thomas. That could have been Clarence Thomas, the guy who's hauling the guy who's driving a truck, the guy who's lifting boxes, the guy who's, you know, the guy whose life is stunted, the guy who never got the kind of opportunities that Clarence Thomas got. And he insinuates that Thomas is in effect, and I, I certainly want to get your summary of what you read in this piece, but he insinuates that Thomas is in, in effect a traitor, uh, a traitor to his race, a traitor to his class, to his uh, point of origin, and is is a enigma. How How can we explain this man's uh, uh, apparent abandonment of, of uh, the obligations that naturally accrue to him in virtue of his background. Uh, and and, the, I, and when I thought of you as I was reading the piece because the language aspect of the argument where he goes back and forth into the dialect is a, is a move. It's a particular kind of literary move that puts the reader in the position because Thomas is you know, trying not be that guy. He's trying to eschew and disavow. He's married to a white woman. Can he get any further away from his own blackness and so on and so forth? What nauseated you about the piece? Or if I didn't do a good job in accounting for how uh, Mitchell Jackson approaches this writing, you, you can fill in the blanks. You know, I should say I don't know Jackson's work other than this, and there's no personal issue. But no, the, the gala at the beginning where you've got everybody translated into this, this rural, non-standard, and often despised dialect. Very, very effective. I mean, that's damn good. But, oh, yeah. it's also so mean. 
Because what it's saying is that it's underlying, here are the people he came from. There are these people living in remote rural poverty with the authenticity of their Jamaican Patois-like dialect. And Clarence Thomas has left this behind. So he's, he's humanizing, dignifying the original, the, the people who Clarence Thomas grew up among. But the, the idea is to say, here they are in all of their splendid yet needy authenticity. And now yeah. here's Thomas living in this you know, gated community with his white wife, smoking cigars with white people. So that was bad enough. I had a hard time even getting through that part, you know, maybe partly because Creole languages are one of my specialties. And I'm thinking this is the most gullah most people, most readers are ever going to see. And it has Including to be this one. in order to flog Clarence Thomas. But then also Jackson makes the assumption and th- th- talk about essentializing notions of what blackness is, which you were That's touching it. on about yeah. seven minutes ago. He thinks there's only one black way to think that there's certain positions that any good black person is going to have. Thomas doesn't have them, and therefore, and this is the thing, he must be consciously going against the needs and wishes of his people to work out psychological scars of his own, which he picked up partly from being an affirmative action candidate at Yale or something. He has to be this study in psychotrauma. And that's one way of looking at it. However, it's a bit of a stretch in terms of how human beings tend to actually work. And the thing is, Jackson, who is this educated person, I'm sure cosmopolitan person, genuinely can't imagine that you can be a black person and even have black identity in various ways, which Thomas always did and still has, and still yet does. not think like Mitchell Jackson. He really doesn't know. And therefore, his conclusion is that Justice Thomas must be evil and crazy. And I'm also disappointed that Esquire published that because that is such a parochial view. And, you know, I, I am probably less enthusiastic about aspects of Thomas than you are, but nobody deserved what that article did. I found it simple-minded reasoning. And so the fact that it was rhetorically so deft was depressing to me. It reminded me, the New York Times has been very good to me. I really love writing for the New York Times. I'm honored to be there. I have read the New York Times every day for about 33 years at this point. I will do so until I die. However, there was a piece about Ward Connerly in the New York Times in the summer of 1997 that I found disturbing. And I hope I'm talking about the New York Times a quarter century ago, not the New York Times that I work for now. But Can I was, just tell people that Ward Connolly championed the anti-affirmative action ballot initiative Proposition 209 in California, which succeeded in eliminating affirmative action in that state in 1996. So this article was published immediately thereafter. I just wanted to put that on the yeah, record. Yeah, that's, that, that's important. He's beginning not to be the household name he kind of right. was at the time. But they did a he said, no, I don't want to go on about it, but they went back to his birthplace and they found his father. And, you know, I remember one of the final lines was, I think it was the father saying, when are you coming back, Ward? With the idea being that he had you know, betrayed his roots. And I thought, what, is this really the proper summation of what Ward Connerly is about? This piece on Thomas reminded me of, of that one. And I just put myself in the mind of being a Justice Thomas reading something like this, and I'm sure he's fine. But I think it's not fair. And in the case of what Jackson did, I think it was very simplistic and demonizing thinking that I would think national journalism would be more careful about. Agreed 100%. Isn't it interesting that he and his editors felt no need to demonstrate that Clarence Thomas's opinions about Citizens United Uh, or about gun control, or about abortion, or whatever they might be. His conservative opinions were contrary to the interests of Black people. It was just taken for granted that that was the case. They, They felt no need to demonstrate it. He has a paragraph in there where he says something like, I can anticipate your argument, John McWhorter. He doesn't use your name, but the (laughs) argument that you just, that we just made, which is he gets to be a conservative, even though he came from a poor black background. He gets Mm -hmm. to be a conservative. He can think for himself. He anticipates that. And he says, nah, I ain't buying it. This is America, rotten from the bottom up. The nigga don't know where he came from. He's forgotten where he came from. He got his head all the way up this butt of this white woman. I mean, these are my words, but this is basically what he's saying. And he's running from his blackness, America's blackest child, ABC. He's running from his blackness as fast as he possibly can. 
And that polls on the writer's part, Mitchell Jackson, that polls of a grieved betrayal by a black man who doesn't think like him is, is just taken as apodictic certainty. I mean, just like it's mm. self-evidently true. Mm-hmm. When in fact, that's the question. The question is, I mean, what's, what's most interesting to me about Clarence Thomas is precisely the fact that that biography and that political ideology are married to one another. Doesn't that tell us something about America, about our human condition, about uh, whatever? It, it, why does it have to be a puzzle? You would never, ever, ever do this to um, a uh, who, who would be the iconic figure, Justice uh, Antonin Scalia, the late Justice Antonin Scalia, staunch constitutional, strict construction, inter- interpretive, you know, uh, conservative out of the University of Chicago Law School and whatnot, this is just as, go back and parse his uh, Italian-American working class upbringing on behalf of the project of somehow giving an account for his conservatism, which would otherwise be pathological. I mean, that kind of uh, essentialist, you use that word, and that's exactly correct. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, I, I think I've said my piece about it. Uh, it's intellectually lazy. It, it rests comfortably in this cocoon of we all agree, this bubble of we're all, you know, the conservative court that John, that uh, 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 Donald Trump has generated for us, which is ruining America. And here's a black man who's a handmaiden of it. That, that's just way too easy. It's, it's just way too easy. You know what it sounds like to me? That, that guy in the dorm lounge. You know, when when you're in college or maybe a little bit beyond and, you know, he sits in the dorm lounge and he holds forth about, you know, the real deal about race. He's really figured it out because he's taken a couple of African-American studies classes and he sits there holding court. And, you know, especially women are you know, listening to him and he's got a way about him and he probably writes an editorial in the college paper. That's that guy's vision of what it is to be loyal to your race. You would think that somebody writing for Esquire would be beyond that, or that the people editing him would be beyond that. The people who edit me when I write these days, for example, at the Atlantic and the New York Times, would not let me buy with reasoning that shoddy about anything that I write, and they are quite correct. Why is that allowed just because it's Clarence Thomas? It's not fair. It's just not fair. I wondered, you, you're the linguist, and the Gula Geechee dialect stuff, uh, I assume it was uh, true to the ear. Uh, could have been because- better. It could have been better. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm, I'm now I'm just look, being angry. It wasn't deep, Gulla. I mean, the truth is there are people there who speak something even more different than what they put. But the thing is, if they had used that, it would we be incomprehensible. And so, yeah. yeah. But no, what they speak, what Clarence Thomas is talking about having spoken and feeling ashamed of, isn't this business of saying in instead of ing and, you know, uh instead of er. It's in many ways a different language. It's like Jamaican Patois, where if, especially if they talk quickly, you can't understand what they're saying. West Indian Patois is spoken in a dialect in South Carolina, except it's called Gullah. And so, yeah, Thomas grew up basically bilingual. You can't show that in Esquire. But I remember thinking also it's very light Gullah, but I understand why they have to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Whew, that article made me mad. You ruined my day. You you sent the link. I, I want to see. see if you agree. I heard an echo stylistically of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates in the voicing of some of those paragraphs and in the, in the clipped sort of clever wordplay character and in, in the move back and forth between the interviewing of the subject and the discussion of the larger... I, I don't know. It, it felt Coatesian to me. Yeah. You're right. And I'm forgetting now how good the writing was. He has a way with a line. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. In that Coatesian way. That's true. Yeah, I felt that too. Yeah. We've coined a word. We've coined a word here, John. You know that's gonna stick. <laughs> well, I, it's okay. And by the way, Tanahasi, if you're listening, and I know you listen from time to time, bro. Uh see, we respect you. We appreciate that you've had an impact on the culture. We still disagree with your ass, but we respect you. <laughs> Twitter's going to pick that up. (laughs) (laughs) We're the black guys over here. Glenn and John, we've had an hour. That's enough of your time this time around. Thanks a lot, John. We'll talk to you next time. And by the way, we got to make a date for the Q&A. Yes, Glenn, this was good. See you very soon. Signing off.